<laughs> good everything, <laughs> y'all. Good everything. Uh, hey. Yeah, I was like, what? We both not in hoodies? What's going on? What's happening? Right. <laughs> right. I had to go to, I got to go to to the other, uh, to, to the to the side join gig, uh, to Howard. <laughs> Today it's called, I'm across the street. But, but I'm at the mothership, though. I'm over here with, with General uh, Garima and, and the folks at oh. Sankofa. I'm just in the, right. in his in, in one of his studies. So he, some of his Beautiful. arsenal is up back there behind me. Right. And my robe and my academic regalia. Maybe before we leave, I'll show y'all what I had to put on to go walk in the, uh, this is the inauguration of the 18th president of Howard University, Ben Vincent III. Uh, we talk more about that later, but you know, I don't, well, anyway, we jail broke the black university. So this yeah. for me to be for me to get dressed and to put on my academic reggae and to walk across the street. Uh, I've had a chance to have a couple of small conversations with the brother. I know his work. Uh, it will talk maybe a little bit more about that later. In fact, I know we will because it's one of the things I want to talk about. But, you know, I walk over there. I walk over there and watch him get sworn in. I, yes. I do that. And for me to say that, you know, that's. that's <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> It's also wild how easy we fell into the imitation of the pomp and circumstance. Mm -hmm. uh, but, 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 but as I think about all of the, the tribal rituals, that too, like, um, like the Haitians were able to find their gods inside this thing called Catholicism, which we, uh, you know, we Form Christianity, as my brother KRS One reminded us. Oh, we formed all the religions. They don't even have a blueprint for that. That's ours. They didn't take our language. That all of this is ours. But as as I'm thinking about uh, the rituals, we are people of ritual. We are people of of order. So we this are. is ours. And and, and, and and it's so funny. Here we are in the uh, the the Day of the Dead. Uh, alley, so Dia de Little de los Muertos, and I think Doctor um, Amen is doing something. So Yada got something brewing around here, but yeah, there's also yeah, yeah, she got some brewing on. You know, I and mean, she always got something in, in the air. But uh, and there's the White House, uh, the March to Freedom Plaza today, uh, the the protest in the war uh, today. A lot of people gonna be down there, so I gotta figure out if I can hit. Uh, as many of those as possible. But but to, to what you just raised, I was reading something, Matthew Sandoval, who was a scholar of uh, Day of the Dead, himself Mexican, you know, he said, you know, there was a move in the 60s and 70s during the Black Power, Chicano Power, kind of third world, first world, as we would call it, force movement, to say and remind people that the Day of the Dead is not Mexican Halloween. And so, you know, but he said what has happened since capped with like Disney's Coco and then continuing it is increasingly Hollywood has invaded it. So in some ways it has bled over, but he says something's very interesting. The transformation and adaptation are what ensure any tradition's survival. So you're right. All, we brought all our ways of knowing with us. They tried to knock it out of us with that Catholicism. We absorbed the Catholicism and remixed it. And so listening to you, talk to our brother, Brother Parker, knowledge reigns supreme over nearly everyone. As he's driving down the street and calls ended, that was a moment that, uh, just reading the comments, even when you posted that clip of it on YouTube, you know, I, I felt the same way everybody else did in our governance formations. I'm sitting there, my eyes watering. I watched you get choked up. I ain't never seen that in real time on your show. <laughs> you understand? So, I mean, what was going through your mind is this kind of thing is, because this is a brother who has remixed knowledge and a lot of people, have been introduced to thinking about ourselves differently through this brother. And for him to say to you yeah. that he's a soldier in your army, he listen, right. I'm whatever you need. That was a, I mean, what were you thinking? Yeah, that, that? That, that was the moment, you know, it's, um, you know, pragmatic and very uh, almost literal. You know, I don't, I don't uh, necessarily dream in technicolors. I'm not a fanciful person. I'm very, you know, like, okay, A, B, C, D, this got it from here to there. Let's, let's get there. Um, that was unexpected. Number one, you know, it's like, you know, I invite people on, so I'm ready for people. And I usually have a game plan. All right. I'm going to talk to you about this. This is what I want to talk about because I'm trying to extract, just like with you, I'm trying to extract things that I think we need like little building blocks so that somebody can be inspired or somebody can say, I can use that to do this. And, you know, so it was a very, you know, boom, 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 boom. So he calls in randomly. And when I see, you know, we have a caller <laughs> sheet and I was like, Kara's one, it was you know it was first of all it just stood it was weird line five <laughs> line five I was like 
okay, you know, people call up, give us yeah. names, is, you know. Yeah, you trolling me? Is it, this is not Kara's one. Yeah, I mean, whoever yeah. it is, let me just say. Yeah, know. let me find out, right? And, <laughs> and so, but it was, it was wild because, you know, it's the 50th anniversary of hip hop and I've been thinking about how not to fall prey to the, you know, way in which they want us to celebrate something that to me doesn't have a beginning, middle or an end. It, do you know what I'm saying? Like we, we're living in a society that needs to mark things and somehow put a flag. Muted. I don't know why. There we that go. Happened. There we go. Look, look, look. Uh, last word heard was flag. That ain't nothing. Yeah. But the devil, yeah. the devil is know, a I know. liar. I was like, you a damn liar. Um, damn. Yeah. yeah. Hip hop. So put a know. flag. We heard you say put a yeah. flag. That yeah, was but hip hop, hip hop, like our breath, like our life, can't have a beginning, middle, and end because it's an ever evolving space of uh, oppression, expression of oppression, but also expression of art and love. And, you know, this current iteration that has been masterminded by folk who have a particular agenda to keep us in a position, uh, you know, that that makes them comfortable and keeps them at the, at the top of the food chain can't be, can't be chained. So to me, KRS One represents the genesis of that. You know, somebody that came into hip hop telling us that we must learn, telling us about knowledge, telling us about knowledge of self. And so when I was doing this, Chuck D was on my list, right? Got to sit with him. Um, yes. Curtis Blow was supposed to come in, but he was under the weather. And so that was about to be like mm. something. But I was almost like, all right, Chuck D by himself was probably what needed to happen. I did the mm. the thing with um, Kevin Powell uh, and Kieran Mayo, uh, the, the founder of Honey Mag, because that yes. was foundational for me. And then I wanted to do KRS One because again, and, and I'm trying to reach different people to try to get to him. So for him to call mm. random was like, what the hell? <laughs> You know, and then for him to say the things, because I don't know who's listening. I never know. You never know who's listening. And because know. it's radio, it's just me, the microphone, and whoever's in the Zoom with me or in the, the right. studio. So I don't know who's listening. And so for him to say he's been listening and we're li and we're listening, it spoke to a collective that I always imagine. You know, when I play We Are One at the end, everything is intentional. You know, yes. everything yes. be like water. Everything's intentional. Uh, let us see telling us to rise up, stand up, you know, let's go intentional. And so I'm I'm like it 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 codified for me that everything that I've been doing for the last nine years on these airwaves and 10, 15 years before, both in them book streets and on on radio before with the morning show at RL, mm. meant something, you know. And Absolutely. sometimes you don't know. You don't know. Like I, I feel it in class, you know, because we got Nubian, Nubia, you know, we, we can yeah. look at the chat, we can see the people. And but that was wild for me. And then what he said out of his mouth uh, uh, ripped through my spirit. And I was like, mm. I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what to do with this. And I wanted to reject the fact that I, you know, you're a soldier in my army. I'm like, uh, no, sir. Um, no, we're all we're all foot soldiers. We're all out here doing the thing that we're supposed to do. So I, I you know, I just I was just a little overwhelmed by that. And I'm still processing, if I'm being honest, because I don't really know you know, what to do with it other than to say thank you, which is a tough thing. <laughs> it's like, okay. Uh, of just... course, of course. No, I, you know, I understand that. And, and it's an awesome responsibility because it's not just an encouragement, it's an expectation. So when people say things like that, I can imagine you feeling, you know, it's a responsibility. What you've given me is, is, is not so much a compliment as much as an instruction to keep going. Yes. In other words, to say, yeah, I, I want to join you. I want to join that energy. But then, of course, that means that you have to keep going. So, and that's, you know, that's the other irony. You know, I, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I get, um, I'm, I'm the type of person that if, if I'm not seeing the results, like I'm not gonna just keep going. I'm not, I'm not that. Right. I'm not a workhorse. Absolutely. I got other things to do. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I got other Absolutely. things that I can do. So if it's if it's not penetrating and resonating, then it's not the thing I'm supposed to be doing. On to the next thing. And I my my career has been an on to the next thing kind of. You know, if you look at it, on to the next. Okay, that's not working. All right, on to you. Oh, you don't want me over here. All right, oh, I'm gonna build the next thing. I'm all constantly moving forward. I'm. In so that. You're right. Was an edict to keep going, and I was like, "Man, I was just about to not keep." Going. <laughs> and, you, and you said that. I mean, sometimes it gets very lonely. I, I mean, I know it's. I mean, it's just me. But no, there there are countless 
it really, and this, you know, we live in a society where, as you say, everything is real time response, everything is real time feedback. And the reality is that I'm glad you, you said penetrate because this is penetrating and not this, just this, just, you know, these last several years, but everything before that was penetrating and is still penetrating because, you know, like Dizzy Gillespie said, they asked Dizzy Gillespie, well, you know, how do you define jazz? And he says, well, I don't really use that word, but uh, what about improvisation? He said, well, improvisation is the act of gathering together all the evidence you have accumulated for how you resolve how to get from here to here to here. So everything you do is a consequence of all the evidence you gathered over the arc of your entire life. And so that momentum now just empties into this thing. And we're at a moment now where people are looking for answers. I mean, our people are dying uh, in Congo and dying in Haiti, dying in Newark and Philly and DC. Our people are under assault in Brazil and Argentina. So what is happening now in historic Palestine is not unique in that sense. However, it's given a flashpoint and people now are looking for answers. So, you know, somebody with a with a wide uh, ability to communicate with people like ta like our brother ta Coates, you know, he takes a stand and you can't cancel him. But did you see, and then the young sister at uh, the young sister New York Times Magazine, uh, Jasmine Sullivan, they canceled her because she signed a letter. Now she signed another letter a few, uh, a little while ago and they didn't cancel it. But for this letter, Simon about Palestine, you know, Jake Silverstein, the editor of the New York Times, oh, well, you know, we agreed that she has to resign. You can't cancel Tana Hasi though. And so, you know, but, but what you've done, I mean, how many times, Prof, have we heard people say, if you don't see the lane you need, make your own lane? Well, you and KRS having that conversation is just another iteration. I won't even say level, but another platform, another kind of acknowledgement that there is a new lane that has been created. It isn't, we're going to create a new lane. No, that new, you didn't say I'm going to create a new lane. You just created a new lane. And people are on that lane. This can't be canceled because it's us. <laughs> you can't, can't, we're not asking you for nothing. And, and now people have to come this way. Right. <laughs> so. somebody, somebody in chat was like, oh, um, well, you, you need to charge less. And I was like, do you ask Netflix to charge? I mean, I don't know where you're being fed, where we are not asking anybody outside of this for money. We're not flooding you with uh, advertisements and all this. This is being built brick by brick by the people. If you can spend whatever you spend on Netflix or Hulu or all of these things that may or may not be feeding you, but absolutely you mm. aren't getting this. I don't know why that's a, you know, and that's fine. It's sacrifice. You know, if you could spend whatever on Dunkin' Donuts, this costs less than your monthly Dunkin' Donuts coffee bill, you know? Absolutely. Um, and, Absolutely. you know, but at the end of the day, it's all about what you value. And so that's why I don't, you know, we're not going out here, please join us, please come, please come in, hit the like, yeah. subscribe, you know, other than freaking the algorithm, which we should be more uh, cognizant of how our eyeballs and algorithms are used against us. You know, right. because there's only certain things that they push out. They don't push out everything um, right. on purpose. So, you know, we should be more, more proactive in our own power, that's in our own freedom. You know, that's that's right. that's, the, that's the challenge, right? But you know, challenge. don't question if it's if it, you if you can't afford it, that's fine. We do have scholarships and things like that. But it should it should be something that you want to do. And I want people who want to. I, I want to be around people who want to do something, not have to be it's controlled true. into doing something or or shamed into doing something or or um you know, want to follow, a, a, you know, oh, once the bandwagon is here and now everyone, <laughs> no, don't wait for the bandwagon, be the bandwagon, bring a wheel, be, bring a spoke in a damn thing, put an yes. engine in there, put a, a, a spot, you know, like be involved in building a damn bandwagon. Don't wait Absolutely. for it to be rolling and jump on it. You know, like I Absolutely. just feel like we are the builders of everything. Why are we Absolutely. waiting for somebody to build something for us? So that Absolutely. was the thing, you know, Um, and I got to talk with somebody who knows you and I said, the be, to be in community with an actual genius, you know, there's very oh, few people that impress me yes, because yeah. uh, a lot of stuff is for gazy, you know, like we, we, <laughs> figured out, we figured out how to, you know, to build a facsimile of what it looks like to be smart. You know, we may mm. be lugubrious and have some words to say on the, on the people's platforms in two minutes, you know, we can sp spin a yarn or, you know, turn a phrase and make everyone sit back. Oh, that dancing monkey is so smart. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you better us, call, yeah, you, you better know, teach us, this morning. For us, it's like you. I mean, I've never met anyone that went to law school and they practice and then got a PhD and then teaches yeah. or teaches in a way music, art. Every I mean, it's just like 
So I'm, I said, you know, for me, the excitement is, you know, stuff that I just need to extract. So I'm like giddy to get up. It's like, <laughs> whether, whether we hit record or not, I'm like, what do you right. know about this? What are your oh. thoughts on this? Because I want to get a perspective that I don't have. And I don't have to, you know, be in a, you know, I do have to be in alignment. Let me not say that either. Because I feel like we say that. Yeah, I don't have to. We are in alignment. I need to agree with you. <laughs> you know, like agreement but, is okay. Let's agree. Even the, even the disagreement is, is, is toward a common objective. What's the purpose of our work? And I mean, and I and I'm grateful for you to say that. I mean, and I, you know, we all have our roles, our places, our our, our gifts, and you know, one of your innumerable gifts is being able to convene people and see how the pieces fit together, and then to just t step out there and build. And as it comes, you still collect, absorb, curate, and this that is a genius that. You know, it, it takes a particular kind of genius. Now, yeah, I mean, look, if, if I spend the rest of my life just reading and looking at stuff, then you close your eyes. <laughs> That's it. But, but, but you know how that all fits. And and you know, well, yes. all I'm thinking, all I'm thinking is, whenever you close your eyes a hundred years from now, uh, we we need everything you like that can't go with you. All of this, right? So well, we we got three years one, of conversations now. I mean, <laughs> day one, it was like, oh, this has to be recorded, mm, collected. Mm. Like there can never be a time a hundred years from now where no one knows you and the work uh, that you've done and the things that you know. That would be a disservice. So that that has mm. been the journey of in class with Carl. Uh, and then I this morning, you that. dropped the the title, got me on Google, and I'm looking up. I thought it was Plaxis, and I was like, that's not what it is. PL. Nope. So I'm looking up some computer thing. I was like, we're going to talk about some computer thing. And then I went back. Right. I was like, Praxis. So you gave Praxis. me a word I never heard before, which is well, a damn, you know, I was like, I don't it, know. It's not, it's not from me. It's not from me. It's actually from Ben Vincent. That's what I mean. Okay. In, in response to something I said, which was, I thought was very interesting last week. But no, but, but, but before that, I mean, like you say, yes, there's a, there's a subscription fee for narrative. And what people don't see, and I won't get into detail for this, but for the people who are not in narrative, for people who are watching this outside of the narrative thing, who was out on YouTube and wherever else this is echoes on all the other platforms, you know, every penny that is is, is put into, into that narrative subscription is an investment that is turned right back around. It enables the platform to grow and to, and so when we convene, I mean, you know, I never in my life thought that, you know, you had, you were talking with our, uh, Brother Otis Moss the third the other day, you and Kevin. And I was thinking, you know, this is a pastor of a very important church, a brother who has been out in the world, uh, well educated, Morehouse, Yale, uh, you know, who is committed to his people, who is now taking a lap, taking a lap in the wake of the laps taken by the great Jeremiah Wright. And of course, his own father, Otis Moss Jr. And I think about that. And every Sunday, he's in the pulpit at Trinity. And there are people there, there are people streaming. But every Monday night, there, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500. We've hit even when we do it, Octavia Butler, 3,000 people. This is a convention. This isn't just a subscription. We're together. And then for the folks who may not be able to do that, the investment of being here week after week, Saturday after Saturday, and having the YouTube space for the people doing I, I tell you, that sister, uh, uh, C. Mim who sent that message about her mother thanking us because her mom made transition at 64 after battling cancer. And she put it in the YouTube comments, but she said her mother was a teacher, a forever learner, and it was her best friend. And she watched in class from episode one, from session one, and she joined Narrative in Nubia. And, she, and, and when that sister says she found so much joy and purpose in learning in this community, she went to office hours on Monday. She intended in class until her last month on this earth. And, and when she said, although she raised me in the black church, which I do appreciate and honor, it was the space. It was this space that gave us the language and deep appreciation for ancestors. I'm grateful for this because I can continue to say her name and call on her and know that I, her only child and not alone in this world, even though I felt very much alone since she transitioned. Thank you again. She put that in the YouTube comments. Her mother was a subscriber. Who knows whether C. Mim is or will continue. I hope she will. But the point is that there are people on the that side who are like, thank you. And I, I mean, I, I'm sure you heard it as well. Many people, they listen to you during the week. If they're not a subscriber to Sirius, they see you here. and you can't, that can't be, yeah, hit that thumbs up because we're going to freak the algorithm, as you say. And then there's the thing that the algorithm can't capture, which is what? 
everything. It can't even capture everything. That's why Kara's one riding down the street and say, you know what? Let me call in. Today I got to call in and tell you this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm, mm -hmm. That was God. All right. So what, yes. what is what is practice praxis? Is it pra well, practice? No, yeah, you know, practice. Oh, no, no. Practice is praxis uh, a derivative of practice? <laughs> <laughs> well, praxis equals power. It, I love that. It, love it that. could be. Well, well, you know, it's interesting because you know, praxis is very simply as you saw, and as people know, and if you didn't know, I mean, it's basically putting theory and practice together. So we know what it does in theory. Let's let's try it. And it came as a consequence of something that happened this week. Uh, something that happened uh, in the week leading up to uh, Dr. Vincent's inauguration over across the street to Howard today, this morning, we, uh, the university had a series of uh, like events. They did yoga in the yard. They had a reception. Howard students did a, uh, did a showcase of talents the other day. It's very interesting. And, and one of the things they did was put together a symposium, faculty symposium. And the, the symposium was entitled, We Center Blackness which I thought was like hilarious. I'm like, really? We center blackness. I know we do, but when you say it out loud out your mouth like that as a lead up to a new uh, administration, I'm saying, what y'all doing? We center blackness. And then after the colon, it said, Howard diversity and diaspora. Okay, I see this new cat putting his stamp on this thing early. Why? Because Ben Vincent III is a scholar of uh, the African diaspora, as it's usually called. And I'll talk about that more in a minute, too. But uh, if you want to look at his work, he did an early work. I think he was still at Barnard in Columbia. Uh, his father was in the military, mother a school teacher. Um, he's a true academic. And uh, has done a lot of work around the African presence in Latin America. He, he wrote a book on black soldiers in the Spanish militia of the 17th century, so the 1600s. Even going back to the 1500s, actually the 16th century, in his ma in his in his Majesty's service, I think was the name of the book. He did a book on race mixing and racial categories in Brazil. Curated that I think Cambridge University Press. My favorite of his books uh, is a book he did on a brother named Virgil Richardson. Virgil Richardson was a Tuskegee Airman who left the United States for almost 50 years to live in Mexico. And uh, Vincent heard Richardson give a talk in Minnesota, I, I believe, if memory serves me correctly. And he was so fascinated. He says, the historian, I, I was so fascinated by this guy. I wanted to know more about him. So I approached him and said, can we talk? He said, yeah. He said, OK, well, I want to come see you. I, can I, you know, so he, the, Richardson by then had come back to the United States. He's living in Texas. So he would go to Texas. Vincent went to Texas and stayed with him, interviewing him, asking him questions about his life for about a week and a half. And then that led to years of work. And ultimately, Ben Vincent III, this is what I told him the other day. I said, man, anybody spend that much time with a black elder and they don't run you off? That says something about your character. You must be a good dude. He just started laughing. And so the book he published was called, it's called Flight, F-L-I-G-H-T. It's a memoir of a Tuskegee Airman. And what he did is Richardson is telling the story and Vincent is telling the story. It's blended. And so what Vincent did was bring all his research skills to bear as a historian and surrounded Virgil Richardson's story with all of this research and all this rich stuff, found other living Tuskegee Airmen who had left the country. You know what? Like, forget America. I'm not one went to Haiti and lived for years. Others, Canada, other places just leaving the country. This brother Virgil Richardson was also a founder of the American Negro Theater fascinating figure but anyway i saw that to say that so when you know you see we center blackness howard diversity and diaspora i was encouraged because see i know this guy's work i didn't know him and i got a chance to meet him over the summer very briefly not in a formal setting because i'm not one of the people that chase cloud i'm not a cloud chaser people talk about cloud i'm not a cloud chaser. i'm gonna do my work as one of the former presidents of Howard University, my friend and brother Sidney Rabot used to always say, we used to joke about it. I mean, we work with we, we're the sons of working class fathers and mothers, you know. So we're not really impressed by the, the university. I'm still not impressed. I will die unimpressed by the university. I'm impressed by I'm not impressed by shishi foo foo Negroes. Okay, so we used to laugh about it because you come out of a meeting or come somewhere, you know. You know what? One thing about it, Dr. Carr said, "Was that President Rabot?" He said, "They ain't going out workers." No, hell no, they ain't going out workers. Cause I can get a job. 
<laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I'm not looking for you. So I'm not searching out people to curry favor and the air kiss and the change of cards. Or, you know, come in. No, no. Do your work. Do what you're supposed to do. And it's not going to show up in the metric either. How many books have you published? Mm. Okay. Well, is that how you measure value? I read your book. Let's talk about it. When I read your book, well, you ain't read the articles I wrote either, and I got plenty of them. So if you even ask me that question, it means you haven't done any research, which is kind of sad. But uh, I know you think I just kiki around here, you know, with the young people, and they thought Dr. Carr, he just be right here laughing. So if you can imagine that I don't care, then that would be a good point of departure for you approaching me in a conversation. But anyway, so. I saw that as backdrop to say, well, I'll see what this is going to be. I was, you know, it was interesting because I got an invitation to be on one of the panels, one of the faculty curated panels. Shout out to my uh, sister, Angela, Angela Cole Dixon, uh, works in the provost's office, Tony Wutok, the provost, uh, the committee that put things together, Dana Williams, um, Lisa Crooms, dean of the law school, um, and my friend, uh, Felicia Rashad, who's the dean of the College of Fine Arts, who moderated the panel I was on with one of my former students who's now a professor at the law school, Justin Hansford, who's also the U.S. representative on the U.N. Uh, High Commission on Race and people of African descent in particular. Um, good young brother, uh, runs the Thurgood Marshall Center over at the law school um, and a number of other people. Donna Grant Mills, who's in the School of Dentistry, spent some time in Ghana. We talked about that on the panel. Kudor Schnell, former dean of the School of Social Work. It's a very interesting conversation we had. But at any rate, I saw it to say that, you know, this is the base of operations for us, meaning this work we're doing with Narrative and Nubia, this work we're doing in class, this all the work on narrative, the courses that are being taught, the people that are convening, you know, it's all with the idea, with the purpose of moving from you know, exposing folk and, and exchanging information, folks are exchanging information to gestating a sense of not only being inspired, but being kind of uh, moved to connect. And then from that, everything just kind of emerges. Well, that is the work. The Black University been jail broke. Now, I am grateful to be able to, you know, teach the courses I teach at Howard University. Um, I'm grateful to be on the faculty with Mario Beatty and Valethea Watkins, to be on the faculty with so many elders and ancestors and colleagues and comrades and folks coming in, you know, it's good because HBCUs are my life. I went to a HBCU. I went to a field Negro HBCU. So I'm unimpressed by the petty bourgeois black elite HBCUs either. And I work at perhaps the one that the people think of first. And that's not a diss at General Oliver Otis Howard University. No, it's not at all because I know who's there. And, you know, again, thinking about this in the context of praxis, we were having a conversation, right? So we're sitting on this panel, Dean Rashad, and they had a setup. It was like four or five of us, Dean Rashad, asking the question. She's sitting on one end. I'm sitting on the other end. They put my little name in the seat. And I'm like, this is cute. So I'm sitting in there. And shout out to WHUT who recorded everything. It hasn't been posted yet, but when it's made available, we'll put the links in Newbie and Narrative. And forgive me this morning, y'all, because... Uh, I usually would have the app up, but I'm using the phone, so I don't have the app up to 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 see what people are saying, and I don't have the YouTube uh, uh, channel up either, so I can't see what people are saying. So please forgive me. Um, so I'm like, did y'all set me up? Because I'm at the end, and I guess they're gonna come down the row, and that's exactly what she did. So she gets to me. People are talking about what they're doing, their schools, their programs, initiatives, traveling overseas, connecting with Black folk on this question of diaspora. So she looks at me and says, Dr. Carr with that inimitable Felicia Rashad style. Mm. Dr. Carr, I've been led to believe that you think perhaps we shouldn't use the word diaspora. <laughs> I said, well, Dean, first of all, thank you, of course, for being there. It's kind of, you know, and everybody for being here. President sitting there, Provost sitting there. I said, yeah, I think, you know, diaspora speaks to place like physical place. And we can talk more about this in class uh, or, or, or office hours Monday night, but ultimately I don't want to get to the point. And I talked about how diaspora 
in my mind, ties us perhaps too closely to the politics of geography, of physical place. And physical place, then you've got Africa and the diaspora. Yes, that's true geographically, but in a sense of being African people, I think a question of global Africana is much more valuable as a concept. You know, the, we are African wherever we are. And again, thinking about this idea of culture that we started out with, the idea that transformation and adaptation are what ensure any tradition survival. The idea that in Brazil, that I said and everybody there, that, you know, the joke is in many ways that Ifa was taken to Brazil for safekeeping because when you go back to Nigeria, you go to Ile Ife or you go to some of these places where the, the, the oldest shrines are, the oldest rituals, you might see that they are better preserved in terms of how they move through time and space outside of the continent than they are in the continent. Well, there's an extreme value to being on the continent. Remember, Marcus Garvey never set foot on the continent of Africa. But that animating force, he said, well, yeah, the diaspora is what led Africa. Wait, let's not do the geographical thing. I think we can rethink global Africana. So that led to another kind of, again, y'all can watch it for yourselves once they posted it. I was grateful even to be in the conversation. But near the end, uh, after everybody, had, we, had, we had exchanged and back and forth, we're talking about a number of things. And Dean Rashad said, well, Dr. Carr, you got the closing comment. And I was like, I see you, my friend. <laughs> so I had said earlier that you know, Howard University, and I think it's true for all HBCUs, Howard is absolutely not unique in this regard. We are at a moment where there is opportunity and there's crisis. And the thing's got to be, there are a lot of conflicts. There are class conflicts. I mean, things we've talked about many times before over the arc of this three and a half years. We've been having this conversation on Saturdays. And then in office hours, puzzling through this. But ultimately, I said, we got to figure out a way to as we're grounding this knowledge, as we're doing this, and this is why I think Africana studies is very important. You don't need every department at an HBCU to be Africana studies. Black studies at an HBCU should be a small, tight place where you're thinking about theory. You're thinking about how to think about these things. And of course, now that we've jailbroken it here, that's what we're doing. Even as we're doing information, we're thinking, that's what the conceptual categories are about. And I said, and then ultimately, the question is a question of power. I said, you look at Palestine, and I said this, you, know, you look at Palestine, for example, historic Palestine, the United Nations has had rules in place for a very long time. You just saw the UN, the New York director of the New York office of the UN High Commission for Human Rights resigned. His letter should be read by everyone because he's talking about what it means to have rules that, that, that are not being followed. He says, this is genocide. Let's be very clear about what this is. It is genocide. And it is being committed in real time in violation of all these rules. So I was saying, this, you know, you can have rules, but if nobody's going to enforce them, if there's no framework for enforcement, then what you don't have is power to have those rules come to life. So we you know, said a few more things and you know, then the next iterate in, after every panel, the president was in conversation with the provost responding to what the panelists had said. Well, the provost, Tony Wuto, has his notes and he's sitting there and the president's sitting there with his iPad. He, he's constantly, he's taking notes the whole time, all day. He didn't, he came to everything. He did the yoga, he out there with the young people. I'm saying, this guy's this, this interesting guy. I'm watching him, you know, from a distance. Cause again, I ain't in nobody's space. The meetings on, you know, you know how people do to quote KRS-One, you know, I'm so-and-so, I'm this, I'm that. <laughs> but they all just wick, wick, whack, you know? Well, why are you coming to the meeting instead of talking about what well, we all need, you reading your resume, why are we jockeying for position? Where's Carr? Carr's over there in the classroom with these 19 year olds trying to work something out. Cause at the end of the day, and that's the last thing I said on the panel. If it's hell below, we all going to go. So and then Dean Rashad was like, well, and on that note, we'll uh, transition to the president. So he and Wuta are sitting there having a conversation, the provost. Wuta says, well, I'm going to start with something that the car said. And he started talking about crisis and opportunity. And at the end, he brought up, and then, you know, Vincent gave a very interesting answer around the idea that these things are real. The class stratification and division at HBCUs. He says, he said something I thought was very important. He said, you know, don't expect to come to a university as an 18 year old and leave at 22 or 23 to, as a young person and have your whole life transformed in a way it's gonna stay that way the rest of your life. 
He said, the best we can do here is, you know, arm you with some skills, some equipment, you know, some experiences, you know, some information, and then you continue to develop as humans, which is why coming back is so important. It's very interesting, very thoughtful, I thought. And then the end, he said, you know, in response to, uh, and then the provost said, well, Brother Carr also said something else. He said, you know, he talked about this question of information, this question of intellectual work, and then power. How does it translate into power? Intellectual work, how does it translate into power? Of course, we think about narrative, we think about Nubia, we think we've been doing week after week after week. How does the information we've been having conversations about how does the framework of thinking about this differently from Africana grounding with social structure, governance structure, ways of knowing, science and technology, cultural meaning making and movement and memory, how does that framework help us as we struggle for power? And he said, Vincent sat there for a minute, he said, you know, it's an interesting question. He's looking at, he's looking around, but he's looking at me, I'm sitting like the second row, he said, you know, I think, that there's something in there that would activate this. He says, praxis. I looked at him and I said, that's it. This dude's all right. We're going to see where he goes with it. Because again, university bureaucracy is hell on earth in many ways. And HBC ain't no different. So, you know, I, I got all my clothes. I'm going to wear my regalia. I'm going to walk in this thing. And I'm going to hear him give his speech. I'm going to watch him get the investiture and be like, okay, let's see, let's see what you do. And I know that the metronome in my life, the metronome of what we are all doing together remains where it is now. That has been the blessing in the curse of COVID. That has been the blessing in the curse of a global pandemic. That has been the blessing in the whole restructuring of the way we think about the world, the acceleration of these trends is that, that we are all now together and we ain't never gonna not be together again in one way or the other. But I'm gonna go over there and I'm gonna see this because when he said that, then he explained, he says, what we have to do is figure out a way for the study we do, for the work that we do, to then lead to the type of activity other than work, because work itself, that study is activity. You know, this isn't a question of theory and practice. It's a question of intellectual work and then get power. No, it is a form of power, but what enables it to be activated to empty into other forms of power is praxis, theory and practice. And that's what we do every Monday night, every Tuesday in the Metanetra class, all the other classes, Sunyata's class, all the other classes, the yoga class, all the other conversations that are being held in narrative in the rooms, the teacher's room and the and the and the farmer's room with agriculture and the uh, all the, the mathematicians. Every, what we're doing is we're bringing our intelligence, we're bringing our intellectual work into conversation and community and identifying who has these skills, who has this insight, who, and then through that joint revelation, we then empty that into the other work we're doing. That's praxis. And that's what Ben Vincent got. And at that point, I'm saying, you can't fake that. That's a lifetime of thinking about this. That's a lifetime of thinking about this. So I'm going to see what we do. And so that, that was very important. Now, you know, we're not going to stay the same. It's like Vincent said, we're not going to stay the same over the arc of our lives. We are not going to stay the same in terms of culture. Again, San Sandoval talking about the, the Day of the Dead, something that's been practiced for years in Central America, in Mexico. Then, you know, Halloween, which is its own form of ancestor villa veneration halloween hallowed hallowed halls you know veneration but then this fear thing comes in then there's this macabre thing comes in and the ritual of halloween has been commercialized in the various social structures we found ourselves in invade that thing that is very sacred and sacrosanct in mexico and they say no mex you know day to dead is not mexican halloween except your children watching cartoons your children see those costumes in the stores and the children want trick-or-treat candy now so now you're at the point even though the un designated day to dead as a form of quote-unquote intangible cultural heritage in 2003 it don't matter why because hollywood got a hold of it and they got cocoa which is a well done we need a cocoa done by african people in an african venue which we can then communicate through to how we deal with our ancestors but now you got young people old people elders going to the cemeteries in mexico and they gather around Benito Juarez's tomb, former president of Mexico, beloved figure, and they watch Night of the Living Dead. Huh? What just happened? Yeah, Halloween then car crashed. The horror in Hollywood then car crashed into Day of the Dead. So you can't do anything about that. But what you can understand is transformation and adaptation are what ensure any tradition survival. So 
Last night, I went to a play. In fact, let me see. You can't really see it. I put the shirt on underneath. Black nativity. You can't see it. This is a it's a, it's a continent of Africa with black nativity underneath. I wanted to wear this today. Wear that shirt underneath. Because I might see the shirt I got on. But black nativity. Maybe I'll wear it next week so y'all can see. My man Eric Ruffin, director in the College of Fine Arts, uh, directed, a, a, a you know, Langston Hughes's uh, Black Nativity, first debuted in 1961. Uh, a play where Langston Hughes is like, you know, they, white people got the nutcracker. They got all these Christmas things they do, Christmas Carol. We need a play. So Langston Hughes writes this play and it's set to music. It's called Black Nativity. Interestingly enough, it was supposed to be named, I think, Go Tell on the Mountain or something. No, no. What a Morning. My What a Morning, I think is, is what it was supposed to be named. And then the producers, I read this in the Amsterdam News in 1961, of 1961. Just before it was about to debut, the producers say, let's call it Black Nativity. And several members of the cast quit. Because they say, if you call it Black Nativity, it's going to scare off white folks. It's going to be divisive. Among those who quit, two people who quit were Alvin Ailey and Carmen de la, de, de la Vallad, de la Vallad, the dancer. Ailey and de la Vallad quit. What? Now, ironically, years later, Ailey would do Black Nativity. But, you know, it's going to be divisive. Well, we coming into what will immediately be the Black Power era in 1961. We're right on the verge of it. And it stays Black Nativity. Now, it's been done endlessly differently wherever you are. Boston, Cleveland, L.A., Philly, D.C., over and over again. HBCUs, Black Nativity. Black. The one they did that they're showing, that they're staging. Now, these young people are supremely talented. If y'all want to know about theater, go to HBCU production. And I say that because I am absolutely, I'm not biased, I'm sure. People say, oh, you're biased. Yeah, no, no, I'm in the governance formation, who we are to each other. I am a proud theater graduate of Tennessee State University, the T.E. Pogue players. I won the T.E. Pogue trophy. I don't brag about a lot of awards I win, but I don't know that because T.E. Pogue was the first black man in the United States to get a PhD in theater. And that don't even mean nothing. He was grounded and committed to black theater. He was part of that era of uh, Edmonds. And I mean, there were so many, the great theater people. So I'm very very proud of that. You go to an HBCU theater production, you're going to see theater. You go to a musical, they'll take the top of your head off. And these young people did that thing. They are doing that thing. Uh, they, uh, I went to the tech rehearsal on Wednesday night. And after at intermission, I left because I, I was so overwhelmed. I didn't want to see the rest. I want to see the rest with everybody else. And I'm glad I waited. They debuted Monday night. Uh, I think tickets are like $10 for the general public. So if you're around the Ira Aldrich Theater in D.C., get over to see Black Nativity. They got a show tonight. Um, tonight, Saturday. I think they got two shows, two and seven. And then Sunday, they got a show. So Sunday, today, last two days of the show. And you can look it up. Go on Howard's website. Look at the College of Fine Arts. You'll find everything you want there. But, the, you know, I mean, dancing, the dance choreography was off the chain. The singing was off the chain. The costumes, everything, the lighting. And they had this Afrofuturistic gloss on it. So they, you know, they had this tech where they're showing the moon, the stars, you know, here come Mary and Joseph, they dance and sing and they got this choir that's out of this world, the shepherds, everybody, the wise men. I mean, it was, it was, it was. the second half, I'm glad I waited to see because it was all gospel songs. I ain't never seen no young people. I told them after I said, man, I, I felt like I should have brought my white gloves because because I, I needed to usher. Y'all gonna run Nick Rose up out here singing Peace Be Still like that. You can't sing a song like that and expect on a Friday night for these Negroes not to get weepy and run up out of here. And it was all the chain afterwards. Uh, our sister Denise Hart, who was on faculty uh, in theater at uh, College of Fine Arts and a Nubian, which she announced proudly to the audience last night. I said, I say less. He said, no, I'm telling you, I got everything. The shirts, the mugs, I'm in narrative. I'll be in Nubia. So she's probably here this morning. Denise, I, I tell you I was going to say this today, but I, I needed to say it. Just a, a beautiful sister. Uh, very important. Uh, she she works in theater and a lot of related places, always helping these young people with their creative talent. Invited my, uh, uh, Eric Ruffin, the director, had invited Denise to moderate a talk back after Black Nativity, after the show with myself and... Um, Nina, Nina Mercer, Dr. Nina Mercer, who's a graduate of, uh, of Howard in theater and also is now over at Georgetown and developing a center there. Very important conversation that, that she's having. So we talked about cultural meaning making. And, you know, one of the things I said was, you know, this black nativity is anchored in the story of Christ. 
the birth of Christ, but it's really not Christianity. It's Africana cultural meaning making that's using Christianity as the excuse. Because when you see the kind of iterations of the singing and the movement, this is very African and it overflows the boundaries of any religion. And then at one point they integrated a young brother who came out with a drum in front of Mary Joseph and the baby and he, has, he starts drumming. And I said, and I'm glad that young brother who's a freshman, by the way, Eric told me, I said, I'm glad he didn't open up on that drum completely because if y'all thought Peace Be Still was going to run somebody up out of here or my Lord, what a morning or all that. You think that was going to run somebody up out of here. <laughs> If he hit that drum the way he, I know he could hit that drum from what I could hear him doing, it had cleared out the whole theater. Our audience would have been empty, would have run out. I said, that is the Africa. So the idea then that transformation and adaptation are what ensure any tradition survival is at the core of Africana cultural meaning making. Now the collision comes in, we start talking about movement and memory. Because how do we get the momentum of memory? How do we move this forward? How do we move this forward? What endures is our determination to be black, to be free. Now, the implications of that determination are what shake up the social structure. And that's where I wanna kind of wrap up today in, 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 a, in a minute or two, to think about this in terms of the implications of sitting with our ways of knowing and activating them, the implications of our cultural meaning making. There was an article in yesterday's New York Times. This is yesterday's New York Times, the weekend art section. The family that turned Malcolm X's life into opera. Now, Prof, you probably talked about this. I don't know if you talked about it yet, but you know, uh, X, the life and times of Malcolm X opened last night at the Met, the New York Metropolitan Opera. This is the famous uh, uh, opera written by Thulani Davis and her cousins. I, I had the uh, director on the show last Did week. Did you? Yes, oh my goodness. Just the, just the slave playboy. Oh my God. So, you know, I'm not. What, not what you think? What you think? I don't know what to think because, you know, this is not my genre of, of, of things that I like, but I. Being, bl being black is your genre. Oh, Go no. Ahead. You appreciate it. <laughs> you know, when you think about opera, you think of, you know, fat, fat white women um, talking oh. about. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that. Br that. Brunhilde. Yes. 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 <laughs> this, this ain't that. So. Um, this ain't that. Yeah, not at all. So say more, say more. No, 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 this ain't that. And yeah, the minute I saw the guy that direct slave play directed that, that's when I said, I ain't going to see this. Because I, you know, I ain't got but so many breaths left on the earth. And do I really want to spend some of them sitting here being tortured? But I said, no, I got to be open because you can't be that ideologically rigid. And it came in the wake of having someone having read the autobiography of Malcolm X and there's a collision course. And so I'm open, you know, if I can get to the Met, I'll see it because I certainly have the Lonnie Davis's script that was published years ago and it's been produced before. I even have a recording of it and you probably know Prof and a lot, a lot of folks here know that it has been performed. It hasn't been performed in a long time. Black nativity, to borrow language that is used to describe black nativity actually, and to, to borrow language that you used, Prof, at the very beginning, to say what you are not, and you are absolutely not, even though your discipline allows you to go day after day after day after day, you're not a workhorse. Black Nativity, Langston Hughes' 1961 play, which is performed over and over, and is often referred to as a workhorse. It's a workhorse piece. In other words, it's the thing that if you are Black and went to a theater, you, you may have seen Black Nativity. Right now they got a hip hop nutcracker. Whatever else they're gonna have, Black Nativity is the thing that people. My brother Jeff Obafa Mikar down in Nashville. They they when he had Amun Ra Theater, they did Black Nativity. You go and everybody does it different. You put your own thing in there. You put your own spin on there. And Eric Ruffin and them ripped the frame out of this. Was a different kind of thing. Well, X the opera was written in one way, and actually Thelani Davis talks about with her cousins. She talks about how Anthony and Christopher how. As they were composing the opera, this is when Betty Shabazz was alive. And Flynn Davis talks about the two of these two sisters having conversation. And, you know, she softens some of the language and some of the language in the in the in the songs when Betty is doing her solo because she didn't want it to be painful for Betty. But after Betty made transition, now that they've staged this, they put that language back in. So this thing is a living thing. But I want to read something very interesting, I think. 
because it, it, the, the opera is staged in three movements. First is called hate, second is called fear, and the third is called love. Now I immediately dismiss that in terms of governance formation thinking. Hate, fear, love. Christopher Davis says the first act for me was one sentence and you wonder why we hate you. Act two is the first reclamation of Malcolm through the nation of Islam. And it was important for people to see the power of that message for someone like him. And he goes on. The third act is all about the second conversion. I thought of it as a classic tragedy where there's false unity that's destroyed and you come back to the real unity and the real salvation that comes from the pilgrimage to Mecca and then he can die. And I'm saying to myself, what the hell are you talking about? The second conversion. It's very interesting because he then goes on and says, you know, Betty Shabazz said that we made the nation of Islam look too good. And I said, quote, if the nation isn't compelling, your husband's a fool, end quote. Kind of a tough thing to say to the widow. Then through line, he talks about writing. Then Anthony comes in. She said, Anthony Davis says, she was very protective. And I understand why she acted that way about his legacy. But we were trying to create a drama and make him human and vulnerable so that people identify with him. You ain't got to do nothing to Malcolm for people to identify with him. That's why you got our opera, because people identify with him. And they made it, they cast everybody, which I'm kind of intrigued by this. They cast it so that they got this everyman motif. So you don't make it look like the people themselves. You kind of make it so that everybody can be interchangeable on these, uh, in these characters. Last night in Black Nativity, uh, um, Eric cast the three wise men, two of them were women. That was, that was a brilliant, brilliant casting strategy. Every one of them kids. Oh, my God, the talent. Mm. I, w I wish they, I hope, now nah, they don't videotape. Um, typically, I'm, I'm, they need to, but you got to be there for it. I really hope y'all can come see it. But look at this. This is Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. Now, clearly, Elijah Muhammad taller than Malcolm. That's not how it works. But that's part of the theme to make it every man. I'm like, what y'all doing? Okay, everybody be creative. Like Black Nativity, do your own thing. But watch this. Again, going with this idea that what endures in us in terms of ways of knowing is the determination to be free. So they put this play on clearly defamiliarizing Malcolm. Hate, fear, love. Like this, like, like Malcolm was out here just hating everybody. Like they, I wish I had brought the, uh, mm, mm, I didn't bring, because they did another story on it on Wednesday. Was it Wednesday's paper? It may have been Wednesday. May, oh, it was Thursday's paper. It was Thursday's paper because I showed it to my Black Aesthetics class. I pulled it up on screen. And the young, that got Malcolm as a little boy and his sister Ella as a little girl. The girl that plays Ella is kind of a butterscotch, not even quite butterscotch, maybe cafe au lait, maybe not, maybe caramel, light caramel color. When you see pictures of Ella, Ella is Malcolm's sister by both of them share the same father, Earl. Ella's Earl's color, chocolate. This is deliberate casting in a way. I said, I'm sure these are talented young people. It's not a, it's not a critique of them at all, but it's acknowledgement that what you're trying to do here is defamiliarize Malcolm. So I can only imagine how the direction is going to go. And I'm sure I'll be quite intrigued if and when I see it to see how these choices are made, because this is all about cultural meaning making in the present. But what is movement and memory? Deep in the movement and memory of our people are ways of knowing that will not be displaced. You're not gonna trouble them. And this is what happens. This is why I laughed at the end of this. It says this. Uh, Anthony Davis says, it's a different moment than in the 80s. Classical music has been trying to address decades long exclusion of people of color and opening up not to just different people, but to a different aesthetic. Okay. In my black aesthetics class, the first thing we do, we spend the first month getting rid of the word aesthetic and go to meaning making because aesthetic carries a lot of baggage from Western philosophy. But in order to get rid of it, we have to understand what it's doing. So that's why we read a book called The Short History of African Philosophy by Barry Hallen. It's an interesting thing. I don't get rid of nothing without knowing. Young people, you got to know what it is because you can't just come in and say, I'm getting rid of. No, why? what is it to get rid of? You got to know. Anyway, this is what Christopher Davis says. At the dress rehearsal in Detroit, Set out the temple number one, Detroit history. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, Master Farad Muhammad, interestingly enough, looking at Rick Ross and Buster Rhymes making a hip hop song called Master Farad Muhammad. I mean, what are they doing? Anyway, <laughs> again, the culture echoing, changing, transformation and adaptation. These two, okay, letting you know it's a lot of Muslims in hip hop. That's why I think you should read the book Muslim Cool, which is very interesting. But he goes on, he says, at the dress rehearsal in Detroit, they brought all these school kids and their response to the first act, the one they named hate, hate, he could have named it love. 
This just love you. Love your people. Fear. Fear what? Fear of not being conscious? No. Fear of the white man? What you talking about? Anyway, the first act is hate, right? He says, at the dress rehearsal in Detroit, they brought all these school kids and their response to the first act, it was like somebody was saying what they felt. And it's in this opera house. At the end of Malcolm's aria, they were like, yes. And unfortunately, considering the way things are going, there will always be that reaction. I didn't misread that. And unfortunately, considering the way things are going, there will always be that reaction. You know what's unfortunate about it? And I think this is how he meant it. I hope this is how he meant it. I don't know how he meant it. I'd have to hear it to see. And maybe even then it wouldn't be clear. But what's unfortunate is that going back to Mike Wallace making his star turn by interviewing Elijah Muhammad and them in his 1957 documentary, The Hate That Hate Produced, what's unfortunate is the conditions of this social structure we're currently in require us to act a certain way, to be a certain way. But what you're touching is our humanity. You're going to stop displacing our humanity. So them kids watched that, and when Malcolm hit this, they was like, yes, this is what I've been saying. And they're like, ah. so how are we going to make the journey to love? You don't have to make the journey to love. Why? They in love right now with him. They're in love with what he said. They're in love with him. There'll be no compromise, no, no controlled show. Malcolm X from hip hop, <laughs> Tommy boy, no sellout, <laughs> no, no compromise, no controlled show. You either this or that. The thing about Malcolm people loved was he was able to convert his intellect into a form of praxis. It wasn't theoretical. So what do you think about race relations? Yeah. When you stick a knife in somebody's back, you ain't really helped them by pulling out the back of the knife halfway. In fact, you won't even admit the knife is there. People are like, yes, that's what I was saying. In other words, this is the thing. Well, our people are trying to gather all the evidence of how we can get from here to here to here. That's improvisation. We've been on the improvisational fly since somebody took us. And that is the genius. This is what Dan Black is talking about. The genius of how we move through the world is based on our ability to compromise. I was on the bus Thursday afternoon. I went down to the Martin Luther King uh, Library for a meeting between classes. I came back. I hopped the bus in Chinatown. Let me ride on back up here to go to class. About three o'clock in the afternoon. Bus is packed. Africana ways of knowing. You see elders, you get up. Not always. People done kind of got away from that. But there was this elder got on the bus, a black man. And I was sitting there, I said, Bobby, you want this seat? He said, oh, thank you, man. He sat down. He sat down. He started talking to me. He said, man, I tell you, man, sometimes these people don't know how to treat veterans. I said, you a veteran? He said, yeah. I said, where? He said, Vietnam. He was walking with a cane. He said, it's been tough, but I'm still here. He said, I got an artificial hip. He rolled up his sleeve, had his coat on, had a a wound clearly here that it healed over. That's why I got hit with machine gun fire. I said, what? He said, yeah. I said, but you're still here. He said, I'm still here. Every day you wake up is a good day. I said, that's right, Bob. So we talking, we riding, right? We riding on Georgia Avenue. So he says, uh, man, uh, my grandson called me the other day, said, I'm hungry. I said, how old is he? He said, 24. I said, 24? <laughs> He said, yeah, he's 24, man. He, so he's over at my place, my apartment, man. You know, I'm hungry. So I said, well, I'm trying to help him. You know, I want him to get a job. But, you know, he's had problems with drugs. His dad, you know, has problems out there. You know, his mom. You know, see, we're talking. And he said, but the other day I came home. He was standing on top of my table. And I was like, boy, get that off that table. He said, you can't make me. And then the brother told me, this veteran, he said, I was a, I was a cop. I said, you were a cop when you came out of the military? He said, yeah, I was a cop. About 20-something years, I retired. He said, I'll never want to call the police, but I had to call the police. I said, damn. He said, he brought on himself. I didn't want to do that. So we're talking about that. Again, improv improvising. This man trying to figure out how to do for his grown son who has been caught up in these streets. And at the same time, he feels threatened. He got to figure out what to do. He's been a cop, so he knows what cops do. But he's trying to, you know, he got a stairway order. We're talking about that, the politics of that. And then he says this. He said, but I really wasn't, didn't want to be a cop. I wanted to be a mortician. First one, he said, man, said he wanted to be a mortician. I said, a mortician? Why? He said, you know what my job was in Vietnam? I said, no. He said, when you see enough bodies of people blown apart, a body that's only half 
and then from the torso down, the guts all laying out. Our job was to scoop up the guts and put it in bags. He said, I wanted to be a mortician to get that out of my mind. Mm. To get that, I wanted to be a mortician to get that. And then he, go, then he goes into being the police. Now he's an elder, got off at Howard Hospital. He's probably going there to check on his doctor. You know the importance of black institutions? There's a hospital for him to go to where black people are not going to look at him crazy. Because well, you look like my uncle or my grandfather. You look like my pop pops. So we're going to take care of you here. It's very important for Charles Drew to exist, for Morehouse School of Medicine to exist, for our university and Meharry Medical School to exist. It's important. Oh, that's something Dr. Vincent said the other day, President Vincent. He said, you know, uh, listening to Donna Grant Mills, the dentist who was on our panel, he said, you know, Dr. Grant Mills, you know, I'm told that oral health, everything in your body begins with oral health. There's, there's an importance to centering blackness in what we do here at the School of Dentistry. At Howard and Meharry, we got to have these because it start with your mouth. And so I'm looking at this elder. I'm listening to him trying to improvise through his life. And I'm saying, you know, I'm here to hear what you're saying, to be in conversation and then to have a conversation with everybody else in this platform that you have said from can we press record and then into narrative in Nubia to interject that because there are countless others like our sister whose mother made transition, who know people like this, who are improvising. You're not alone. And we have to build that momentum of memory to see how people are navigating because you're not wrong and feeling the way you feel and you're not alone. Those young people in Detroit were not wrong to respond to that Malcolm X Aurea in the way that they did. I don't care what you compromised to get it to Broadway, what you changed because things are changed. I don't care what you're trying to be in your own ambition as a director or producer but to, to make sure that this can interact with the social structure and in some kind of way reach all audiences. No, our people know what we need to see. And in this moment, as we kind of wind up for today, in this moment, which is why I said, you know, how do we put this intellectual work, get it to power, it's in itself as a form of power, but that praxis has to now be activated because we're in a moment when we're watching global slaughters, except there's one going on now. New York director, UN high commissioner has resigned. They trying to cancel people like this young journalist, Jasmine Sullivan, Rashina Tlaib, my man, Andre Carson, and Ilan Omar, Muslims in Congress, under assault by purebred, WWF, Jerry Lawler, adjacent white nationalists like uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and this blow dried Johnson dude, Mike Johnson, who is a full bred white Christian fascist thinking person who is saying, yeah, we're going to give some aid, but we got to take it from the IRS, whatever. But I want us to think about the fact that power means that you have to stand for truth. Like ta said, I went over there, I saw this, I'm embarrassed. And you know, and, I, and I'll end with this because there have been a series of, of, of protests, not only all over the, the, the country and all over the world. I mean, Prof, you saw the people who were in my adopted hometown of Philly that shut down 30th Street Station the other day. I'm like, <laughs> for 10 years, I took that train to DC to teach. Almost every day, back and forth between Philly and DC. So I know what it means to shut down the train at the William Gray 30th Street train station in Philly. These are white people, Jews and, 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 and others, but mostly Jews, shutting it down, not in our name. And I'm saying, forget the politics. Let's deal with the common humanity. And this is where I want to end. Young people, I spoke at a, a, a rally that was held, a commemoration, a kind of gathering was held at the flagpole on Tuesday. Then Wednesday, they had something they got to teach in. They're planning teach ins. They'll all be down at the protest today in D.C. And in the conversation, I'm having a conversation with some one of my colleagues, Palestinian colleague in sociology. And we're talking about this two state solution. And I said, well, you know, and she said, no. When people say, you know, when many people say from the river to the sea, they mean they want Israel to cease to exist. But when others say, uh, which is, you know, no, these are human beings. You got We got to figure this out. Nobody killing nobody. We got to stop the killing. Okay, Joe, Joe Biden, you out here chastising. This was in today's New York Times. U.S. faces questions after expelling nations from African trade block. Joe Biden over here telling people, putting out Rwanda and them, talking about it went Joe Bird. 
at this conference they're having between U.S. and African countries that started in Johannesburg this week over the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Uh, Biden wrote to Congress that Uganda has been removed because it, quote, engaged in gross violations of internationally recognized human rights, end quote. Well, that's what the U.N. High Commissioner over the New York office called your government when he said that you funding this. You're not neutral. You're giving money and ammunition. You give, you got drones attacking over. You got, sir, you, you bombing other countries. You got a whole fleets over there now, not fleets. You got whole ships over there now moving into the strait and attacking. So what you doing? You talking about violation of human rights. And then the UN commissioner in the, in the New York office enumerated the violations and then gave 10 solutions potentially. One of which is you got to create a space where everybody gets to vote. And people, I'm going to hear people say, here we go. We're going to get voting. You're a shield for the Democratic Party. Your lips stitch them shut. Praxis. Praxis. It's all fun and game. Somebody in the YouTube comments from last week was like, when y'all going to have Claude Anderson on? Hey, I read all Clyde Anderson's books. I watched a lot of his videos. I think he has some very interesting things to say. And hey, he can come into Nubia. We can have a conversation in office hours about this. It's very all of what he thinks. I think it's very intriguing, but that's not what we do here. You know, this this quick fix mindset, this short attention span tells us to, to what to do, tell us what to do, listen to the authority culture. No, no, no. I'm serious about collective work. The collective work has to be done collectively. This ain't a TED talk. This is <laughs> You know what I'm saying? This is, is your people. And so I ain't mad at Claude Anderson. This ain't about Claude Anderson, but it's about understanding that we have to engage. And this is something that, that Dr. Vincent said, too, in terms of when I had raised the question of theory, not theory and practice, but the question of crisis and opportunity at HBCUs. He says, I understand. And I absolutely get what you're saying. He said, and we have to try. I respect that. I respect the hell out of that. We have to try. See, the problem I have sometimes with academic leadership and you is that people define the we very narrowly. They don't want to upset the balance. There are a lot of people at HBCUs that they don't want to upset the capitalist formation of the country. They they don't want they just want to make sure that twelve percent of the one percent is black, to quote Adolf Reed. <laughs> but I'm not a class reductionist either or a determinist either. Meaning what? I don't think that. You know, everything can be solved by just overthrowing everything. No, we are in a social structure that we inherited. We didn't make it. In order to change it, we got to engage it. In order to engage it, we have to be informed to understand tactically how to how to do that. We got to transform the intellectual work into praxis so that we can acquire the power. The Democratic Party, Republican Party, that ain't the issue. The issue is how do you acquire power? We've talked about that over and over again. So in thinking about this, when I say voting, Talking with this sister, we stand there talking. Or we on the phone talking actually after my class in law school, but planning another teaching. I said, yeah, I'm in, please, please. I'm always in. So the whole thing is, you know, the, the two state solution doesn't make sense in this regard. Remember when I was in Montgomery and we quoted, uh, what's the guy's name? The uh, former prime minister of, uh, uh, of Israel who said, Israel is either gonna be a democracy, which means it'll cease being Israel, or it's gonna be an apartheid state, but it can't be both. The two state solution, if you wanna have an apartheid state, that's something else. You know, remember, and I'm gonna get too deep into it, but the point is this, if everybody participates to quote, you know, juvenile or whoever, what you scared of? <laughs> what you scared of? I'm scared that I'll lose my identity. Well, not if we have a common humanity. So if you got one state, some people when they say from the river to the sea, in Black Nativity last night, and I brought this, this, this point up. I said, we all singing, we're all in here getting happy, the music, the second half was off the chain, the first half's off the chain, but the second half, we just went to church. I said, there are a lot of ancestors in this room tonight. Jenny Robinson and uh, 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 Mary Peterson, two ancestors in here I know right now because them the ones trained me when I was a kid at K New Baptist Church to be a junior usher. I need my gloves in here tonight because that child right there almost ran out of here. Everybody started laughing. I said, but this is where it runs into the ditch. Y'all was singing about the Chili Jordan and crossing the Jordan. When people say from the river to the sea, the river they talking about is the Jordan. I said the American Negro without the momentum of memory will get caught up in something that will have you on the side of the white nationalists. And this ain't got nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with being a Jew or a Muslim or a Christian. It has everything to do with settler colonialism. So you think somehow you fulfilling prophecy. 
And the next thing you know, you're watching somebody get blown up and not like my man, Charlie, the 75 year old who I was talking to on the 79 bus the other day who had to scoop those guts up and it changed his life forever. No, unlike him, you ain't never seen no guts in person. So stop treating this like a basketball game. You're not talking about Victor Wimbiyama scoring some points against the Phoenix Suns. You're talking about guts. You're talking about people dying. I don't care who were their parents. I don't care what they believe in. I know people are dying and this has to stop. And if you say this has to stop and they accuse you of somehow being an ideologue, let's dance. It's wrong. And the people who are doing it know it's wrong, but they got an investment in something else. And so, as I said, thinking about this in that context then, getting the momentum of memory, moving from theory to practice, moving from intellectual work to power, realizing intellectual work is its own form of power, but that praxis allows us to then inform the way we move through the world every day. The momentum of memory finally allows us to remember this, that in our struggle for human, our common humanity, we have been here before. I was of all places, I was on my hands and knees in a used bookstore a couple of months ago, and I picked this book up. It's a random issue of the Virginia Quarterly Review from 1965. Uh, C.W. DeKewitt, who ended up being the president of the University of Rochester after he had been a provost at Cornell, but he's an Afrikaner, born in 1902 in South Africa. He wrote an article called South Africa's Gamble with History. Y'all ain't got to get this. I'm just telling y'all what this is. He says, amongst students of South Africa, there is today a quickening of the pulse a moment of truth that is at hand. There's to be a testing of the South African crisis, of the willingness of men and governments to give practical effect to their beliefs. The result may be the crossing of a great historic divide or a plunge into tragedy, or simply the addition of new disillusionment and embitterment to the old. Any one of these possibilities will be a major chapter in the history of South Africa. In the course of 1965, the racial policies of the Republic of South Africa will, be, will move further into the storm center of international controversy. The International Court of Justice will hand down its verdict in the case brought by Liberia and Ethiopia against South Africa. The principal issue before the court is that policies of apartheid applied to Southwest Africa are a violation of the mandate for which South Africa is still answerable to the international community. Now, this is the case of Namibia, eventually, that took its independence in the 90s. This was 1965, which is a decent year, I think, for us, as we know. But <laughs> this is... They are they are before the United Nations International Criminal uh, Court of Criminal Justice is saying South Africa, you violate because you're imposing apartheid in what is they call then Southwest Africa, now Namibia, and you're doing it in South Africa. But they hadn't gotten to South Africa yet. And what he's writing here, what uh, Dikiwit is writing here, is that if they lose this case on Namibia, what becomes Namibia during South Africa, that has implications for what they're doing in South Africa because it's apartheid. Now, parallel because there's a rack of books Israel and South Africa oh my god maybe next week yeah I got one in particular that's crazy about the relationship between Israel and South Africa during apartheid South Africa but guess who was propping South Africa up not just Israel the United States was propping South Africa up for another generation and they had Nelson Mandela on the terrorist watch list here in the United States in part because they said well he's a terrorist he embraces violence this isn't about Hamas this isn't about Hezbollah this is about what happens when you want everybody to have rights and some people don't want everybody to have rights because it would upset what they think should be the social structure we live in. Well, I want to end with Nelson Mandela. Here's Mandela. This is a book called The Sun Will Rise. Statements from the Dock by Southern African Political Prisoners. Because you know what? When I was reading this, I was thinking to myself, you know what, 1965, Nelson Mandela had been in jail three years by then. Let me go pull something off the shelf and remind the world of what Mandela was saying. Here is a man who was jailed, Robert Sabukwe. There was some South African people, uh, folk on campus on uh, Tuesday night. I got a chance to talk to them. Shout out to the School of Business. I was walking across campus on my way to the rehearsal for Black Nativity. And the, and the brother was like, hey, man, I want you to come meet these young people from South Africa. I was like, oh, yeah. I said, yeah, where y'all from? And he said, oh, I'm from Western Cape. I said, I was at the Western Cape. Yeah, I stayed at UCT. I used to pay my respects to the statue of Cecil Rhodes every time I passed it. I can't do it now because y'all took it down. He started laughing. I said, yeah, I left a lot of DNA on that statue over the years, just like I left some DNA on Jeff Davis in Montgomery the other weekend. But anyway, the point is this. Robert Sabukwe, who they put in jail 
then then passed a law in the South African legislature to ban him internally, put him on Robin Island. Uh, the legislature passed a law for one man, the Robert Sabutwe law. He says, he says that the chief aims of the, of the Pan-Africanist Congress, which was the other organization with the ANC, he was in the ANC originally, are the complete overthrow of white domination and the establishment of a non-racial democracy in South Africa, as well as throughout the whole of Africa. We regard it as our historic role to contribute to a United States of Africa from Cape to Cairo, Ma Morocco to Madagascar. But this is the point. He says, the complete overthrow of white domination, period. Then they, people will put a period there and say, see, he's a racist. No, he said, and the establishment of a non-racial democracy in South Africa, as well as throughout the whole of Africa. We don't want to kill all the white people. We want everybody to vote. Hmm. So when I'm listening to these young people and these professors talking about the two-state solution is the way for them to try to wiggle out of this. Ehud uh, is his first name. I forget his name. He was the prime minister before this guy now, the guy who's trying to stay out of jail off of his other stuff, BP. But the point is, no, it's either going to be an apartheid state we can deal with two states as long as we control that other state, or it's going to be democracy, which means it won't be Israel. It'll if it's a demo, if everybody vote, it's going to be all right. No, it won't be all right. Why? This is our homeland. Anybody told you you can't do what you want to do? Okay, so we got to root out people who want to kill everybody, or kill each other, or at least change that mentality if it can't be rooted out. But why can't everybody? We got to evolve. We got to move there. We've got to try. You don't want to try. You never wanted to try. And you want to shut anybody up who is saying, stop the killing and let's try as if they some kind of anti-something. You know what the anti? The anti-settler colonialist. Are you a settler colonialist? Say it with your chest. Please, your whole chest. Stop being a punk. Say, no, I'm a settler colonialist. I was against the Indians in the United, what became the United States. I was against the Africans in South Africa. And I'm against the Palestinians in Israel. I'm against... God gave us the right. They teach your children to this day. That's why these funky ass moms for liberty running around. Right? They need to teach the good curriculum. Yeah, that's that's what that's how we learned it. Manifest destiny. When they pump down our throats in schoolhouse rock on Saturday mornings. The West was meant to be. It was manifest destiny. Manifest. God told us to kill the Indians. Don't do that. So they put Robert Sabukwe away. And then the next is Nelson Mandela. What did Mandela say? You know why they put Mandela in jail? Because he had Unconto We Sizwe, Spear of the Nation. What was that? That was the organization that used violence. He said, this way he said, four forms of violence are possible. Sabotage, guerrilla warfare, terrorism, and open revolution. Mandela is saying this in the dock. He's on trial. But, and if he gets convicted, they're going to give him the death penalty. They spared his life. He spent life. And he, when this book was published, he was still in jail. Mal uh, Malcolm, Lord have mercy. Malcolm was dead by then. No, no. When Mandela went to jail, Malcolm was still alive. He talked about it. Martin Luther King was talking about Mandela. Mandela was considered a terrorist in the social structure, the European social structure. But in our governance formation, we were saying we support Nelson Mandela. Oh, you support terrorism? I'm sorry. Is your name George Washington? No, I'm not living with Mel Miranda, so I'm not going to have you rapping about shit. No, I know what you did. You had my grandfather in chains. You had my grandmother in chains. Don't you think I would have been trying to kill you and loving every second of it if it was going to lead to my freedom? I'm not negotiating with you, and I'm not rapping, away, throwing about, rapping about throwing away my shot because I have the momentum of memory. Mandela goes on and says, sabotage. He says, we chose to adopt the first method, sabotage, and to exhaust it before taking any other decision. He said sabotage did not involve loss of life and it offered the best hope for future race relations. We believe that South Africa depended to a large extent on foreign capital and foreign trade. He says if we do sabotage, it's going to undermine their economics. And it may, as he said, force the voters of the country to reconsider their position. There's a lot of people living in Israel, Israelis, who want to have a one state solution who said we can all live together. Those people are the ones getting arrested by the Israeli, poli Israeli police. They are keeping that out of the media. They're keeping that out. These are people inside Israel. These are people who would shut down 30 Street Station in, in Philly, who shut down Grand Central Station in New York, who will be at this rally today. These people saying, yeah, we can all live together. I can't live together. Well, say it with your chest then. Say you want to kill people. Mandela ends this before they sentence him to life imprisonment. He says, during my lifetime, I have dedicated myself to this struggle of the African people. I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination. People have some problems with that line, but I understand what he's saying. You understand it better now in the context of what he's saying. 
He says, I cherish the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve, but if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Who gonna say that? When you got all our tax money, and you got all the bombs, you ain't got no skin in the game. But intellect plus praxis equals power. So if we know that this is wrong, what are we going to do about it? Because those who are in charge of the mechanism now, is people are dying. And this has to stop. So I'm going to stop there. I'll show y'all my robe. You want to see my robe? <laughs> I'll show y'all something you, you, you probably never seen before. No, I was not going to wear the robe. A PhD robe is usually the body of it. It's the color of the institution you got your degree from. I wasn't going to wear no temple red. So I got African cloth. It still has the three stripes. The three stripes, this indicates PhD. It blue is a uh, doctor of philosophy. So the bunting, let me put this on. <laughs> you got that made, Dr. Carr? Yes, ma'am. I mean, if I got to wear a hot monastic robe, I damn sure ain't going to wear one look like Europeans. <laughs> so this is the hood. You get your hood when you get your PhD. It has the color of your degree. Uh, green is medicine. Purple is law. You see the kind of pinkish. That's uh, that's dentistry. Blue is doctor philosophy. So let me see if I. I'm just gonna put this on. And take it off. I want to show. I got the hat. The hat matches. But then you put that on. You come in. So you got your hood. Y'all see the hood now, right? And then let me see in the bag somewhere. I think I brought it. If I didn't, I'll go in. Tend to hit it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right, so, and I wear it open. This is a tribute to the ancestor Selwyn Carrington, my dear friend and brother, now an ancestor who was on the faculty of history department for many years, one of the historians of the New York African burial ground, and a good son of the Caribbean and a subject of the crown. This has a zipper on it. So typically you would zip it, right? One day I came in, it's early on, it's about 15, 20 years ago. I'm coming in ready to go. I'm in graduation. Carrington is like, car. Yes, sir. Boy, what's wrong with you? What you talking about? You Americans zip that thing up. You're not supposed to zip it up. You're supposed to wear it open like in Oxford, like me. I ain't got no zipper on mine. So from that day forward, I wear mine open. But the blessing will be the day when I don't wear it at all because we have decided to throw off mental slavery and stop pretending like we're a bunch of monks in 13th century Europe. But if I got to wear one, <laughs> I'm going to wear one like that. So now y'all saw something that most people don't see unless you come to a ritual like the one I'm about to go to. Oh my right? God. Oh, th thank, you. <laughs> thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, I was thinking about office hours on Monday when you shared the piece on Africa. And yes, yes. Population. And what kept ringing in my in my ear in my soul, and I'm trying to figure out how to bring it to you know the radio and to the larger audience, this mm -hmm. notion of population control, population Oof. explosion, the lack of population. When, you know when you when you said that word that sabotage thing, what does sabotage look like? And I know for many people when you talk about sabotage, it's like ooh, shh, don't say anything. But that's a powerful thing, and especially when you talk about economic, very powerful economic that's sabotage right. in America. That's right. Looks like the one point right. six billion dollars that Black folks spend on a, in other communities on other people's stuff. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, on other people's liquor. You know, you get your drink on, but go to Uncle Nearest. You know, <laughs> if you're gonna get your dark drink on. You know, let Fawn Weaver get the coin, not Mr. Hennessy. He don't he don't need your money. Teach. You know, uh Louie <laughs> and Gucci and all of them, they ain't never I don't see them in my community building a damn thing. Nope. How about the global majority? You know, if we're gonna do something or or Teach. my walk or walk aware, or you know, like it, you know, if we're gonna Teach. do something, let's let's spend our money in a way that magnifies right and even those who look like us because we just saw atlanta on fire because of that uh, poor keith lee went out and told people about the food <laughs> <laughs> and the service you know y'all were cracking me up <laughs> you know uh you know but we need more keith lee's on all fronts you know for the yeah. salon like 
Like we need to yeah. serve one another with love and power and respect and also understand that collectively our collective power, because it's not indiv individuals, like you say, don't beat institutions. If we're not building yes. institutions, if they're not Ella Bakers in every community, because we all need different things. So only you know what your community needs. Stop yelling into the void, expecting somebody to come and save and rescue. We are the only ones and and we have the ability to build. So why are yes. we... Why are we out yes. here begging somebody for something? And we vote. Why do we vote? Because as you just pointed out, there are apartheid states right now. Y'all live in Texas? Some of y'all live in an apartheid state right now. Florida? Teach. Some of y'all live in where Teach. you have taxation without representation, which was the foundation for why this country went to war so, so called with Britain. And y'all living in it every day, spending Come your on. tax dollars. And now they're going over to serve, uh, to, to destroy other people. And you don't have a voice because nope. you don't vote locally, so you don't have a representative nope. in the House of Representatives where they make the laws to even Come say on. no. And that vote was very they, close. Very close. And gave them Louisiana. And don't forget, Mississippi is coming right here. And that and that white dude running for governor of Mississippi been to all HB, been to all corn homecoming, Jackson State homecoming. Now y'all gonna mess around and let these white nationalists, you, you really think the white nationalists gonna be better? On foreign policy, both parties suck. But let's be very clear about it. You're going to see the show if the white nationalists get back in power. You're going to see something else. And then, hey, if you're ready to dance, then we'll see. But I don't think anybody's built like that. Not like that elder I saw in the 79. That man had to scoop up guts. If you've ever had to scoop up guts, you know this is about something else. You ready for that? Are you ready for that? Is the, somebody, I'm ready for it. Okay, well, I guess we'll all find out together. Uh, yes. So we'll keep we'll keep going. I wanted to um, end with this Wayridge, Paul Wayridge. Uh, just oh, yes, please. Before, whether we're talking about, you know, because the reason why everyone can't get the vote in Israel is because they don't have the numbers. And that's why they gerrymander here in the United States. They know they don't have the numbers. The Republican that's Party the doesn't have the numbers. They don't have the numbers. The, the white nationalists don't have the numbers because really they aren't, you know, they're not the majority of people who hate people. But right. they have the numbers when we sit home. They have the that's numbers right. when we vote disgruntledly. They have the That's numbers right. when we're apathetic. They have the numbers. And so they have to make us apathetic and ignorant and disgruntled That's right. so that we sit That's home. Right. But That's Paul right. Wayne was told us in 1980 what it was, right? He told us. So I just wanted to end with that. And Dr. Carr, you are everything. And I, love so, you. No, so you everything. I love you. And I'm, right. and I'm getting ready to head over here for the walk in and see my man Ben Vincent and see what he's going to say this morning. So let's watch this. Okay. Love you. If, if you see Dr. Carr in them streets, give him a hug for me. All right. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. Now, many of our Christians have what I call the goo-goo syndrome, good government. They want everybody to vote. I don't want everybody to vote. Elections are not won by a majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down.